So in this video, we're going to run through special considerations. So we're going to spend some time talking about instrumental deliveries, episiotomies, cesarean sections, and induction of labor. So when we look at instrumental deliveries, statistically 4% of births every year are um, assisted using a forceps, and 11% of births are assisted using a bontus or a vacuum. Um, what is an instrumental delivery? So an instrumental delivery is when the obstetrician has to use an instrument, so either a vontus or a forceps, to deliver, help deliver a baby safely. Um, why is it performed? Um, so two reasons. One reason is that baby might be showing signs of fetal distress. And the second reason is failure to advance in the second stage. So what this means is baby is moving down through the birth canal, but not moving down as timely as we would like. So an example of that would be if you have been an hour pushing and we still can't even see the top of the baby's head, at that point, we would always link in with an, with an obstetrician to review. Um, if the midwife is concerned, she will always call the obstetrician to review you and review your baby. And if the obstetrician feels uh, instrumental delivery is appropriate, they will always perform that instrumental birth themselves. Okay, how is it performed? Well, I suppose the cervix needs to be 10 centimeters dilated and baby needs to be in the birth canal. And um, baby's position will influence the instrument choice. Um, the appropriate instrument will be applied to your baby's head and then the doctor will gently guide your baby as you continue to push your baby um, and baby will be born. There's always a pediatrician present for delivery when we are using an instrument. Okay, so secondly, an episiotomy. So why might an episiotomy be formed? Um, fetal distress or sometimes with an instrumental delivery, but not always. How is it performed? Well, an explanation for episiotomy, mother's consent and adequate pain relief are always given. An incision is made to the perineum. So you can see the, the diagram there. Baby will be born. The perineum will be sutured by the midwife or obstetrician using dissolvable stitches. Uh, the physiotherapists will talk to you about perineal massage in uh, class five, um, which has been shown to help, I suppose, stretch the perineum a little bit, um, which might reduce the need for episiotomy um, during labor and birth. Um, cesarean sections. So statistically, 33% of our births every year are born uh, via cesarean section. Um, what is a cesarean? So a cesarean section involves the delivery of your baby through an incision to your lower abdomen. And why is it performed? I suppose there are two different scenarios. One is a planned section. Um, so this might be for any reason, such as a breech baby, so baby is coming bum first. You might have triplets in there and your obstetrician has recommended a, a planned cesarean section. So there are a number of different reasons, but generally for baby and mummy's safety. Um, sometimes we can have something which is classified as an emergency cesarean. So we would classify a cesarean section as an emergency um, if it wasn't planned, okay? So anything other than a planned section, we would call an emergency. So typically that would be like a cesarean from labor, we would call an emergency. Um, what might those emergencies be? Um, scenario number one might be fetal distress. So baby's heart rate is showing us that he's a little bit unhappy. Um, but the cervix still isn't 10 centimeters, so we can't yet use an instrument to help um, deliver baby. Um, if we're concerned about baby's heart rate, what we tend to do is we make a little scratch to the top of the baby's head and we'll actually take a blood sample. So we obtain that sample nearly through the vagina and through the open cervix, we can actually visualize baby's head. Um, with that blood sample, we can actually, um, we can evaluate that on a, a machine which processes it on delivery suite, which will actually give us a definitive, you know, is baby still doing okay in there? Or would, would he rather like to be born? So we generally act on the blood sample, okay? Um, and if concerned, we would go ahead with a cesarean section. Um, the other reason might be failure to progress 
in the first stage. So an example of this, it might be a cervix. It just isn't really dilating. Um, so an example might be that we examine mom at two o'clock and the cervix is five centimeters. And then we examine at four o'clock and it's still five. And at this point, there probably is things we can do. We might offer to break mum's waters if they're not broken, or maybe start an oxytocin drip, which might piggyback your body's own oxytocin, making the contractions a little bit longer, stronger, and more efficient. Um, but if we were to check again two hours later, and the neck of the womb was still five centimeters, which would be unlikely, because generally breaking the waters on the oxytocin drip do work quite well. Um, but if the cervix is still five centimeters, we'd start to wonder, you know, there's only a finite amount of time that babies are designed to be in an established labouring womb. Um, so the obstetrician might decide, well, maybe at that point, it's safer for baby to be out than in indefinitely, okay? Both those situations would be situations where, of course, your doctor would sit and chat and explain exactly what was going to be happening and why. Um, as of course they would do with an instrumental delivery as well. Um, who will perform a cesarean section? So a cesarean section will always have two obstetricians present, an anaesthetist to ensure mum is comfy and safe, and a paediatrician to check baby afterwards. A team of midwives and scrub nurses will also be present for the, for the birth. Your midwife that was looking after you on delivery suite, if this is an emergency section, will of course always accompany you to theatre as it'll be really nice for you to have a familiar face there as well. Um, how is the cesarean formed? So an incision is made to the lower abdomen, baby is born um, through that incision and the cord is clamped and cut and baby is handed to your midwife who is usually in sterile pose so that she can um, she can um, carefully transfer baby from the obstetrician over to the paediatrician. The paediatrician will review the baby, a head to toe check, will weigh baby, pop a little nappy on him and bring him back over to you for a little bit of skin to skin. Okay, um, so skin to skin as normal after a cesarean. Um, induction of labour. So what is an induction? So I suppose statistically 30-ish percent of our births, our, our labours every year are kick-started by an induction process. Um, so what is an induction? An induction of labour involves administering synthetic versions of the hormones that your body produces naturally. So in effect, it's tricking your body into being in labour. Um, why is it performed? The most common reason is first-time moms going overdue, so post-maturity, um, but other reasons would be high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, or any concern, concerns really over mom or baby's well-being. Um, who will perform an induction of labour? Um, so most low-risk inductions of labour will be performed under the umbrella of the midwives on the general prenatal ward. Um, however, obstetricians generally have presence during the procedure and they're there to answer any questions or review um, any women being induced um, that may need it. Um, how is the induction performed? Um, so you'll come in on the morning or the evening that you're due to be induced um, and your midwife will review. So she'll give you a head to toe check, very similar to the check that I described on the admission through emergency room video. Okay, so she'll give you a head to toe check, feeling baby's tummy, um, listening to baby's heart rate, performing a CTG, but you'll also perform a vaginal exam. And this is going to guide the midwife as to what the next step is. So if you think back to the video two, um, where we described the hormones involved um, in the labour process. So if the neck of the womb is thick and firm and closed, um, what we'll need to administer is a prostaglandin pessary. So this is prostaglandin is the hormone that your body would naturally produce to soften and thin out the neck of the womb. So we're just giving a synthetic version of it in the form of a pessary, which will sit in the vagina for 24 hours, secreting this hormone. And generally when we check the neck of the womb again, 24 hours later, it's thinned right out um, and much more favorable for labor. At this point now, your waters will be broken and you'll be brought to the delivery suite. 
um, where we'll commence you on an oxytocin drip, which will start off at a very, very mild dose and gradually increase over the course of the day, mimicking early labour, moving on to established labour. And all the pain relief options that we discussed in the previous videos are absolutely suitable for an induction. It, it, is, in a, it is in essence very like a normal labour and birth. It's just the way in which it got started is a little bit different. So it's designed to mimic normal labour and you can use all pain relief options outlined and some low risk inductions may go home uh, for that period while the prostaglandin pessary is in and they'll pop back you know 24 hours later um, for it to be removed and for their um, cervix to be rechecked um, but that's pending certain criteria so just to discuss that with your midwife or with your obstetrician. Is there anything you can do to avoid an induction? So we find, I find this is a question that's always asked um, in our labour and birth class here at the Rotunda. So there are a number of things. Some of them are evidence-based, some of them aren't, okay? But I'll run through them all. So raspberry leaf tea, no evidence to support it works, but lots of anecdotal evidence. So lots of women coming through the hospital saying, oh, it must have been the raspberry leaf tea. So raspberry leaf tea you buy in a health food shop, you can drink three to four cups of it a day, any time from 37 weeks. Might work, might not. You know, there's no evidence to support it, but as I said, a lot of women saying that it does the trick. Um, medjool dates. Okay, so this one, there is evidence to perform, uh, to, to support, sorry. So um, the only time that you wouldn't be able to try this would be if you're a gestational diabetic, because medjool dates are known to be very sugary, okay? So if you're not a gestational diabetic, you can absolutely start munching away on eight to 10 medjool dates every day from about 36 weeks. And the research does show us that it can, it can uh, soften and thin out the neck of the womb. So we just know that a soft cervix, well, that might equal uh, an easier early first stage, you know, so possibly something that might be worth trying. Um, where can you buy medjool dates? They actually sell them in Tesco, um, or most health food shops will sell them as well. Um, sexual intercourse, so how might this work? So we know that prostaglandin softens the neck of the womb, and we know that oxytocin makes some contractions happen. So there's prostaglandin present in male semen, small amounts, but if it was a thing that your body was just thinking about going into labour anyway, maybe these small amounts of prostaglandin might be the very thing that might just trigger labour to completely start. Your body will produce oxytocin if you orgasm as well. So I suppose sexual intercourse is like producing the perfect cocktail of labour hormones. Um, acupressure, acupuncture and reflexology. So um, three complementary therapies that we would recommend if you're going to start them, that you start from about 37 weeks, okay? They will work best if you're seen by a therapist at 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 39 weeks, and 40 weeks, and hopefully by then, you know you're having your baby. Um, we say stay calm and relaxed, okay? So why is that important? As you'll remember from the, the previous video, video two, your body needs to be chilled and calm and relaxed in order to produce the labour hormones. If you're stressed, frightened, worried, anxious, it's going to produce adrenaline and make it very difficult for your body to produce the birth hormones that it needs for this whole process to un unfold. And um, so if you do go, remember, I suppose, number one, that um, only 5% of women actually have their babies on their due date. The other 95% are actually having their babies not on the day that we suggested they might. You know, so have a due month in your head, anywhere from 37 weeks to 10 days overdue. Um, if you do go a little bit overdue, just make lovely plans for every day. Don't get hung up on it. Don't get frustrated with your body. This is your baby's plan, and it's just important that you sit back, relax, and just, you know, enjoy the wait. Um, any questions that you may have about special considerations, feel free to link in with us. Um, and we'll answer questions as soon as possible. Um, thanks a million.